The Terra Papers by Robert Morning Sky. We are not alone. The astronomers are wrong. The scientists are wrong. They are here, but we cannot see them because they hide. They hide in plain sight. We are their servants. We are their slaves. We are their property. We are theirs. Robert Morning Sky. In time, the star being would come to trust the six. By using a small crystal to create images, the visitor began to communicate with the young man. Calling him the star elder, the youth sat at the knee of their friend, examining all of the crystalline images with great care piecing together the incredible history of our solar system and mankind itself. Star Elder's message was simple. Star beings have been here since Earth was a barren rock. They were here when man was created and have been here throughout his evolution. In some cases their involvement was benevolent, in some cases it was not. Man has been guided and he has been misled. The star beings have been our gods and our devils. They have always been here and they are still here now. When pressed to explain his presence on earth, the star elder stunned the six. There was a war in the skies above. His ship had been downed by enemy forces. I am called Morning Sky. Robert Morning Sky. My grandfather was one of the six young Indian rescuers. When I was young, my grandfather told me the story about his the star visitor. He and his friends called him Star Elder, a name given out of respect. But as time passed, his name was revealed to the youth. He was called Bekht. This is his story and mine. In the late 60s, I was enrolled at a university in a religious studies program. Towards the end of my studies, I submitted a paper that briefly summarized the history of man and earth as told by Bekte. I titled the paper Terra, A Hidden History of Planet Earth. I was sure I had presented a well-researched and well-documented work. It was immediately labeled a work of outrageous, if not blasphemous, distortion of historical records and not of the caliber of a serious student of religion. The Terra Papers, the story of Bekti, nearly got me thrown out of school. In frustration, I approached a UFO organization and some UFO researchers reasonably confident that they would be most interested in my story. To my surprise, I was rejected off hand. I was advised by one researcher that UFOs were quite clearly a phenomena of a technology and not the works of the mythical beings of primitive peoples. Curiously, he is now a well-respected UFO author and has recently released a book on the ET slash Native American connection. For 30 years, I have avoided telling the story. The initial response to my efforts was discouraging. But I have recently been persuaded to try again. The history of man and earth presented by Bekti is both exciting and frightening. The creation of man and his place in the galaxy is made clear, but in the process, his nobility and his pride will be injured. The abduction phenomena and the attending gray beings are revealed to have been integral parts of man's history, but are explained against the framework of the purposes of the star beings for mankind. The sources of man's religions and the origins of legendary figures like Zeus, the Minotaur, Osiris and Isis, and a number of other mythological quote unquote, beings are explained and also placed into the framework of the history of planet Earth. 
And so too, upcoming events can be predicted, not from any psychic abilities or channeling, but from patterns of an ongoing effort to direct planet Earth. Man will soon be surrounded with images of asteroids and falling fiery comets. Black pigs will be seen everywhere, as will angel figures. Dinosaurs will become children's heroes and violence will be the foundation of their play. New airborne diseases immune to existing treatments will surface. NASA will be rendered weak and impotent if not terminated. A galactic war of conquest rages over our heads. Earth and man is the price. This is my story. This is my grandfather's story. And this is the story of Bekte. Genesis The explosion rocked the nothingness of the void. Primordial quote-unquote essence was thrown violently outward. Like a primeval ocean, wave after wave crashed out into the black pit of the void. Nothingness beheld chaos. Chaos poured out into nothingness. As the primeval waters streamed outwards, rivers of dark essence swirled together, forming huge whirlpools. As the whirlpools spun inwards, the essence condensed into clouds of gas, superheated from the compression forces in the core of the swirl, sparks ignited the volatile clouds. Explosion after explosion formed enormous balls of fire, supernovas of brilliant red and dwarf stars of blazing blue. Like islands in the waters of essence, the stars formed from the swirls in the spinning galaxies. Time after time, the process was repeated in the void. Time after time, a galaxy was born. In time, one of these galaxies would come to be known as Eridanus. This is a history of one small part of Eridanus and a tiny world known to us as Earth. Eridanus. In the swirling primordial waters of Eridanus, many of the stars give birth to worlds of their own. From the gases and dust thrown out from the suns, the planets condensed and cooled. Elemental gases combined to form moisture, the rain fell to form oceans. Thunderstorms raged, the oceans tossed and turned, crashing on the shores of the surface lands. In the midst of the lightning and fury, a single spark flashed, creating in one microsecond a single cell of life. Single-celled life forms combined to create multi-celled creatures. Multi-celled creatures became complex beings with billions of cells. Fishes, insects, birds, reptiles, plants and mammals. As many different creatures as there are stars in the galaxy came into existence. And in time, humanoids evolved. Fish humanoids, bird humanoids, reptile humanoids, mammal humanoids and humanoids of every kind became the consistent outcome of evolution. As primordial Eridanus man developed, his caves gave way to huts, gatherings of huts became settlements, settlements became cities. The trapping and hunting of animals gave way to fur trading, fur trading gave way to markets, gathering gave birth to gardening, gardening yielded to farming. The needs of Eridanus man became desires. Desires became greed. Compassionate men became leaders. Leaders became conquerors. And a primitive world became civilized. Differences of opinion became arguments. Arguments became wars. 
Curiosity and necessity gave birth to technology. Early arrhythmus man had conquered his world. And then arrhythmus man looked up, up into the skies, and he saw his moon. He created ships to carry him skyward, and his conquest of the moon began. As he stood on the moon, as he surveyed the lunar cities, he looked up and saw the stars above him. Seeking more, he moved skyward again. This time neighboring worlds were discovered. A ridiculous man conquered the environment of the new world and the cycle began again. And so it was that Eridanus man met his relatives in the galaxy. Eridanus bird man met Eridanus mammal man. Eridanus reptile man met Eridanus insect man. And an Eridanus reptile man greeted them all. The many evolved beings of the worlds of Eridanus gathered and talked. They traded, they danced, they shared, and they joined together. In time, they learned from each other and they lived together, and they went to war. Primitive Eridanus man had become a civilized Eridanus man. Primitive war gave way to the science of war. Death, in all its horror, became a tool of progress. Galactic kingdoms in Eridanus rose and fell. Civilizations prospered and died. A continuous series of wars engulfed the entire galaxy. No single empire endured for long. None save one. The SSS Empire In the galaxy of Eridanus, the way of things became war, violence and turbulence. Surfacing above other races as the supreme masters of war, the SSS beings, so called because of the hissing sound they made as they spoke, weathered war and chaos to seize and retain a sizable portion of the ninth sector of the galaxy. Though originally ruled over by kings of repute, it was under the SSS queens that the empire was to reach its pinnacle, known as the SSST. The queens and their techniques of rule became the very embodiment of royal power. The very name for a throne, AST, would be chilling tribute to the deadliness of the reptilian queens. In a galaxy of chaos and war, the SSS beings had no peer or competition. Ruthless in command and efficient in their cruelty, the SSST queens were brilliant politicians and war strategists, using events to advantage and manipulating wars to their advantage and gain. Providing the royals with the power to conquer and reign over their foes was a powerful military force, unmatched and unequaled by any other. Comprised of tall, imposing figures, the SSS warriors were called blooded warriors, with frightening dragon-like faces. Though evolution had long since removed their scale-like skins, the plates on the body armor gave an impression of fierce dinosaur beings. Only a long ridge of bone rising from the forehead and trailing back and over the head remained to hint at their reptilian ancestry. Known as the MK or MG, the appearance of the SSS warriors alone was enough to strike fear into an opponent's heart. Countless wars over billions of years had taught the SSS queens a vital lesson. An enemy or rebellious subject serves no purpose if executed. But if the brain was reprogrammed, resistance was eliminated and an able body was added to the labor force. Mind control was the SST science of choice. Referred to by other races as the ARI or ARI masters. In time they would become known as the ARI of AN, heaven or the Ariane. Today it's known as Orion. But though it had become the epitome of war and might, a symbol of brutal rulership and unrelenting aggression, 
the fates would play a curious trick on Ariane. In their quest for galactic power, the SST warriors had looted the palace treasuries of their victimized worlds. The cultural riches of conquered worlds were placed on display in the museums of Ariane, making the empire the center of ninth sector culture and wisdom. Ariane became the showcase world for poetry and music, art and dance. It was a step, however, unknowing for the evolution of temperance in the SST psyche. The ASA RRR Empire Though the reign of the SST queens on the ninth sector was seldom challenged, of great concern to the Ariane queens were the movements and expansions of yet another race called RRR. Evolved from the vicious mammalian predators, the RRR were still in the early stages of development, their thirst for expansionism unburdened by the softening that continual wars and time brought on. For the RRR a race, war was the entirety of their existence, all else was meaningless. Life itself meant obedience and total commitment to the RRR kings, anything less meant death. So quickly did they create their empire, so ruthless were their techniques, that the RRR would become known as the ASA or overlords. In the ninth sector, the worlds of the RRR would be known as ASA RRR. Led by the fearsome Aiku warriors, a barbaric army with a fleet of deadly starships of overwhelming firepower, the kings of ASA RRR wreaked havoc on the world surrounding the ninth passageway. The elite Aiku forces descended on their unsuspecting targets with unmerciful and unrelenting attack, clearing the skyways of any potential resistance and totally decimating land-based strongholds. Within moments, warrior ground forces, the BH, moved in to annihilate any and all remaining military forces. Renowned for their practice of devouring the flesh of their enemies, the Aiku and BH became known as the DK or TK, the teeth of the RRR. Aggressive and ravenous and relenting in their expansion, the RRR conqueror kings began the slow methodical takeover of the Pesh Metan, the ninth passageway, a crucial star lane. Seizing the passageway would give the ASA RRR kings control of travel into and out of the Ariane Empire, and that possibility was one that the SST queens could not permit. But the ASA RRR kings were a formidable power. The ways of war had been the driving force of their evolution. Every king had demanded much of their military forces. The starship pilots, the Aiku, possessed light beams which could melt targets, cut them to pieces or disintegrate them. The elite ground forces, the BH, used weapons which could emit sounds that stunned the enemy, disintegrated solid objects or could be used to transport an object from one place to another. All in all, the DAK forces had in a short time become an army of devastating power. The ASA RRR science of war was a technology of death called AT. And from this new science, the ultimate warship was spawned. The planet-sized globe with the armaments of all other starships and more. The warship was dubbed the RR or AR. A miniature world capable of a destruction never before seen in the ninth sector, the AR of DAK forces made the empire a force to be reckoned with. The rays of the sun glistening off the surface of the death ship made the AR shine like a bright star in the skies. Though a brilliant star was often a portent of wondrous things, this star brought death and destruction.
SARRR Kings continued to expand their holdings. The SSST queens made a careful gesture of peace towards the conquering kings in the hopes of resolving the dilemma before war became necessary. The billions of years of conflict had taught the SSST an invaluable lesson. War brings death to a winner as well as a loser. There were other ways to win the conflict. Victory was in some cases gained by taking the enemy into one's own folds. The DAK could be won over in a more clever and devious way. The queens of Ariane called for a meeting of royals. If the kings of ASA RRR pledged their loyalty to the SSST high throne and submitted themselves to the service of the throne, then they would be granted control of the outer stars of the ninth sector. Realizing the magnitude of power in the offer extended, the ASA RRR kings quickly agreed to the alliance. The DAK forces and mighty AR Death Planet were placed in the service of the SSST queens. The outer ninth sector was made part of the ASA RRR empire. Catapulted to a place as superpower by the alliance, the stars of ASA RRR became known as the empire of SST RRR SST. Empire born of the SST, dying for the SST, or SSRRSS, Sirius. With the Ariane Alliance to back them, the SASARRR kings began yet a greater effort to conquer and seize new systems, new worlds to add to their empire. Solidifying their power, levying heavy tolls and embargoes on travelers on the lanes of the Ninth Passageway, the SSRRSS Empire had soon become the Ariane. The Ariane queens watched with a wary eye. The moment of betrayal must be carefully planned. And so for a time, a tenuous peace came to exist between the two thrones. All was well until the era of the monarch known as the Great Anan, the elder king of ASA RRR. In the era of the Great Elder King Anan, life on ASA RRR was good. The luxuries and benefits that befitted a conqueror race was theirs to enjoy and revel in. The alliance with the SSST Empire had made the kings of ASA RRR more powerful than ever before and had permitted the people of ASA RRR an opportunity to enjoy a richer style of life. But the power of the throne also made the life of the king more precarious. Treachery, lies and deceit surrounded the king. Assassination plots, military coups, and alien invasions were the everyday matters of the king. The prince was expected to plot for his father's demise. Distant brothers and illegitimate children pretended to the throne kingship. King Anan watched the skies for enemy attacks and peered carefully over his shoulder at relatives and members of the royal court. Such was the life of a king of ASA RRR, and such was the life of the elder king Anan. Seated in the royal court of the great Anan, serving as royal cupbearer, was his brother, the great Al-Shar. Assisting in the governing of the empire, the great Al-Shar served faithfully under his brother, the great elder king. Peace reigned, the empire prospered, until an outbreak of war in the central stars. A series of major conflicts known as the Galactic Great Wars drew both the Ariane Empire and the Empire of ASA RRR into its folds. The Great Elder King was summoned to the palace of the SSSD to render services as commander of the combined MK and DK warriors. Great Al-Shar acting on behalf of King Anan, remained behind in the ASA RRR palace. Seeing an opportunity to betray his brother, Prince Al-Shar decided to seize control of the central ASA RRR forces. The successful coup compelled the prince to further action. 
He immediately dispatched an elite troop of assassins to hunt down and take the life of the elder king. Historical documents would tell of the death in the battle of the great Anan, the hero king who gave his life while in command of his armies. But those who were in the court of ASA Ararar knew why the king had died and who was responsible. Prince Al Shah, royal cupbearer, was now King Ala Al. Lord Prince Anshar, son of the hero King Anan and heir apparent, was captured and placed into exile by the new king of ASA Ararar, his claim to the throne stripped away forever. To ensure his personal safety, the great King Al Al made the grandson of the great Anan his own personal cupbearer. Deposed Prince Anu was both hostage and servant to his king and uncle. Revenge would have to wait. For now he would serve faithfully, but he would learn. Someday the throne of ASA Ararar would be his, this he vowed. In this time yet another significant event would occur, one which would change forever the fate of the ninth sector. A new star was beginning to mature, its young worlds cooling down to form inhabitable planets. King Al Al, recognizing a potential for untapped precious ores and the possibility of a strategic military outpost, immediately sent a trusted and faithful administrator to lay claim to the new solar system. Lord Al Al Im, master of Genesis sciences, had an imposing task before him to colonize and develop a primitive planetary system. The young sun had originally formed with only two worlds in orbit around it and one tiny inner planet known now as Mercury and one larger planet its name to eventually, to eventually be Tiamat. In time six more worlds would form, one pair of inner worlds, Venus and Mars, two central giants, Jupiter and Saturn, and a pair of twin planets, Neptune and Uranus. But it was Tiamat, the tropical world, that would be the first planet developed by Lord Al Al Im in his assignment. Already inhabited by settlers of numerous galactic star systems, Tiamat was both a paradise and a frontier world of danger. The presence of an ASA RRR military contingency force and a direct link to King Al Al and the Empire of Ariane was welcomed by the colonists and their families. Protection and necessary supplies would now be available, Tiamat would become a full-fledged world. Lord Al Al Im began to immediately exploit the new solar system. The sun was called Bad, where death is. In the immediate proximity of the young sun was the tiniest world, christened Mumu, first-born traveler. The next world would become a military outpost. Though possessed of super hot surface temperatures, its inner caverns gave comfortable shelter for the Aiko and BEH forces. This world would become known as Dak Amu, place of the Dak inside. The Red Sands planet next in line was a world with air and water, trees and an environment suitable for settlers to inhabit. A good site for colonists, it also provided a much needed surface land for a central military fortress. This was the world of Dakmu, place of the duck. Beyond the Red Sands world was Tiamat, the center of the colonization efforts of the Lord Al Al Im. The largest of the system's worlds were, was a gigantic planet possessing gravitational forces that made it unsuitable for habitation, but excellent for the production of supermetals. Under supergravity conditions, metals could be forged into combinations impossible on other worlds. Bar Bar U, it was called, world of metal metals. The second titan world was the most dangerous. Internal forces were highly unstable, 
possessing a constant cloud of dust and rock circling around its furiously spinning center and with gravitational forces that pulled many ships into an uncorrectable spin, the giant would be known as Tar Galu, the Great Destroyer. Of all the planets, the ringed one would prove the most dangerous. A distance past Targalu was a large called swamp planet, poisonous gases in its skies. Shanama would be difficult to colonize, but would be ideal for Genesis experiments. The outermost world was called Iru, a near twin to Shanama in size. Iru was a watery world with a misty covering. Though the task was difficult, Lord Al-Alim would prove successful. The extremely high gravity forces on Bar Baru simplified the manufacture of heavy metals, unstable in an environment with low gravity. Military outposts on Dak Amu and Dakmu proved secure and strong. Experimental farms on both Shama, Shanama and Airu showed promise. The settlements on the moons of Barbaru and Targalu were also thriving. But Tiamat was the crowning glory to the efforts of Lord Al Alim. With the support of his king Al Al Baghom, the administrator was able to develop Tiamat into a paradise far beyond expectation. Facilities to extract newly discovered ores were constructed. Atmospheric conditioning centers soon began the tedious task of transforming the skies into a more suitable environment. As a source of precious ores and a strategic control point of traffic on the ninth passageway star lanes, the new system further strengthened the stranglehold King Al Al held on the outer ninth sector. As his final project, Lord Al Al Im constructed a nearly perfect duplicate of the palace of the ASARRR kings. Known as Ki, its name literally meant in the likeness of. The new solar system of Bad had been conquered. In recognition of the efforts of Al Al Im, the system was called Aridu, the mastered place, and its lord was Al Al Im the Engi, Lord of the World in the likeness of ASARRR. Under the premise of executing control of the star lanes of the ninth sector on behalf of the SSST Queens, Al Al was able to control the travelers who entered the galaxy through the passageway. By refusing travel on the star lanes, King Al Al could prevent potential alliances with Ariane from being formed. Negotiations with other galaxies were subject to the whims of King Al Al, an intolerable situation for the SSST queens. The ASA RRR empire could delay or undo all crucial SSST political and economic alliances. King Al Al had turned Aridu into an island outpost of phenomenal power. And though the great Al Al had further strengthened the ASA RRR throne, he had also weakened his position within the SST royal court of Ariane. What the great Al Al could not foresee, what he could not suspect, was that his own future, his very survival, was hidden in the distant worlds of Al Al Im had developed for him. Lurking back in the royal palace was Anu. The one time prince and highly disgruntled grandson of the great An An, waiting patiently for a time in which to move against his uncle. Choosing a day of high celebration of dark victories in battle, when Al Al would not be in the palace, the prince acted. The loyal followers of the great An An, still angry at Al Al's betrayal, joined with Anu. Overwhelming force and lightning speed assured the prince of an immediate success. King Al Al, hearing of the war in the palace, chose not to fight the prince. Fleeing for his life, the great Al Al descended to his faraway palace in the Aridu system. Here, a loyal following received the deposed king with the enthusiasm of thankful subjects. Refuge was found in the island outpost Al Al had developed. Here he would be a king, still adored and still welcomed. 
Back on ASA RRR, the ex-prince Anu celebrated his long-awaited revenge. The throne was his. He was King Anu. But victory was not totally complete. The loyal warrior forces of the great Al Al held fast to the new solar system. The efforts of Al Al Im and the resources dedicated by Al Al to developing and exploiting the new outpost was to return a handsome reward to the great Al Al in the end. Consistency in the production of heavy metals on Bar Baru and continual discovery and exploitation of precious ores, particularly an abundance of gold, made the new solar system indispensable. The strength of Al Al's hold on the solar system, a very strongly worded communique sent by the SST queens asking that a civil war be avoided and the vital resources brought in by the new system all combined to give King Al Al a very powerful position from which to negotiate a tentative truce and a reprieve. With the SSST queens looking over his shoulder, ASA RRR King Anu reluctantly accepted the agreement for the while. For a time, King Al Al continued to provide a steady and abundant stream of precious ores and metals to ASA RRR. The angry Anu accepted the shipments on behalf of the empire of ASA RRR and the Ariane Empire, but continued to look for any sign of weakness, any trouble that might give cause to bring his dark armada down on Al Al. Anu placed his own elite Aiku star pilots, the Ikiki, into orbits throughout the solar system. Any transgression, any mistake made by Al Al would bring down the wrath of His Highness King Anu. To further secure the solar system, King Anu placed his own son, Prince An En, in charge of the elite Aiko starships and a special group called the Aikiki, the Watchers. His title would be Enlil, Lord of Command. To ensure shipments of crucial resources remained intact and on time, King Anu appointed his eldest son, Lord Prince Er, also a master of Genesis Sciences, to the position of NG, the very same position once held by Al Al Im. Lord Prince Enlil would be based on Tiamat, as would be his brother Prince Enki. And Lil would travel the skyways. Enki would develop the system worlds and conduct continuing Genesis experiments on the watery world of Shanama. Mining, production of metallurgical operations would also fall into the realm of Prince Aya's control. In this way, the king was assured his hand would extend over Al, -Al solar system. And so it was for many periods. Former King Al Al would keep his word, producing the resources and maintaining order in the ninth passageway, while King Anu reluctantly allowed a once hated foe to remain in power in the ninth passageway. But Anu would never forget the injury he had suffered under the hands of his uncle Al Al. When speaking of King Al Al's duplicate palace, the great Anu always referred to it in an angry and disparaging manner. An impure palace, he called it. His own palace on ASARR was the pure one. The Aridu palace was the dark one. Tiamat itself was the world of darkness, regardless of its achievements. King Anu would never forget the torments his father had endured, the hatred of a lifetime welled up within his very being.
King Al Al would live, but he would pay for his sins against the family of Anu. But history was about to repeat itself, for in the very heart of Aridu, the grandson of King Al Al, Al Al Gar, heir apparent to the throne of the solar system, had become a far more powerful figure to the followers of King Al Al than the king of ASARRR was comfortable with. Born to one of the Aikiki pilots, the orbiting watchers of Anu, Al Algar learned early the ways of the star pilots and their warships. His piloting skills developed quickly, and in short time he was granted the status of Aiku Master. He, like his father, was Aiku. But Al Algar had a plan. After Aiku training, the prince went to the high palace of his grandfather, Ambahu, the gathering place. He would make a strange request. Rather than rest on his laurels, the prince asked to receive further training, only this time in the military discipline of the elite BEH warriors. The disciplined ground forces that were equivalent to the Dak warriors of the skyways, the BAH, were really feared in the ninth sector. Exhibiting exemplary skills, the prince once again completed his training in short time. Rising with quickness through the ranks, Lord Prince Al Algar would earn the title Iku Marbe. He is a great one of the Aikiki and the BEH. But Al Algar, an honored master of both warrior disciplines, was to garner one more title. He would receive the title of Zu, one who is supreme master, a status given only to the most elite of warriors, a very select handful of fighters. The great Anu was worried. A master of war dwelt far away in the kingdom of Al Al, and he was a prince. The way in which Aikumar Be had pursued his military disciplines in such a brief time revealed much to King Anu. He remembered what Al Al had done to him when he was a prince. And now, the grandson of Al Al, a prince, had suffered the very same fate at the hands of King Anu. Anu was sure he knew the young prince's heart. He knew how angry Akumar Be must be. King Anu would have to take immediate steps to prevent Akumar Be from rising to power and possibly inciting the Aridu colonies to rebel. And so a worried King Anu moved, as his uncle had moved against him long ago. Aikumar Be was made royal cupbearer. Summoned to the palace of ASARRR, Aikumar Be was placed in the seat of the cupbearer, a position under King Anu where he could be constantly watched. In an effort to appease Aikumar Be, Anu bestowed great honors on the young prince, but to no avail. Still, the king could sense the hatred of the prince. King Anu knew nothing would succeed, nothing would change the mind of Aikumar Be. For this reason, he would always be on guard. King Anu had no choice but to be diligent in watching the prince. But there were more troubles for the king in the faraway solar system. Lord Prince Enlil Anu's son, the appointed overlord of the new system, had protested his placement in a region so far from the ASARRR palace. Perhaps he too would give thought to an attempt to overthrow his own father. The BH warriors were loyal but they were also a powerful force and could not be ignored. A threat could arise from a group of rebels within the Aikiki. They were loyal to Anu, but all had families in new solar system, and Prince Aikumar Be had once been one of them. They too could become a threat to his rule. 
the worries in the kingdom of Al Al were many. Anu had hoped that the presence of his sons would help, but the feuding between them had become worse while they had been in Aridu. Though overlords of their very own domains, neither prince was happy. Each had wanted complete control, total dominion over the entire Al Al kingdom of Aridu. Both princes made threatening, almost dangerous noises. King Anu could take no chances in Aridu. Forced to descend to the distant faraway solar system, the king was determined to put things in order. To protect himself from a coup by a vengeful prince Aikumarbe, King Anu took the prince along with him on his journey. Feeling secure, King Anu made his way to the worlds of discord. But as they arrived, Prince Aikumarbe asked a favor of the king. Many of Aikumarbe's family and friends within the Aikiki had planned a welcoming for him. The prince asked to be allowed to visit them. Distracted by the pending events, the great king doubled the dak guards around the young prince and ordered the Aikiki ships be carefully watched. Perhaps this would placate the Lord Aikumarbe for a time. Assured that the situation was well in hand, King Anu agreed to the request. Continuing on to the palace in Tiamat, the king hoped to be greeted with a solution to the battle between his sons. But the dispute over dominion of Tiamat, throne world of the solar system, could not be settled. Prince Enlil made it clear to his father if he was to stay in the distant and primitive solar system, he wanted to reside in the palace as the king of Aridu. Prince Ea argued that since he was older, he was more deserving, and he was a genesis scientist, a way of discipline that was perfect for kingship over Aridu. Seeing no resolution to the dilemma, King Anu agreed to the choosing of lots to decide the fate of Aridu. By chance, Pr Prince Enlil became Lord of Aridu, the world, and Aridu, the system. Prince Ea would remain the NG and would continue to organize the development and recovery operations throughout Aridu. While the decision made little difference in the resolution of difficulties, but it gave the king respite for a short time, a very short time. King Anu boarded the small ship which would take him up to his waiting flagship, the Royal R. As Anu approached the converted planet-sized death ship, he could not have been more proud. The gleaming ship was truly a royal craft. But an unexpected surprise awaited the king. Overwhelming the guards assigned to watch him, the young Aikumarbe and his loyal Aikiki warriors had captured the AR flagship. Aikumarbe would have his revenge. As Anu moved closer, the trap was made ready. But a cry went out, a warning from a loyal Anu warrior. At the last moment, Anu turned to flee. Aikumarbe struck quickly, damaging the ship of the king. The forces of Anu, outnumbered and overwhelmed, struck back. The battle was fierce in intensity, short in duration. The dark elite royal guard had little chance of victory. All they could only hope to do was create sufficient time to allow the king to escape. As Anu fled into the stars on an escort ship, a final explosion and fireball marked the last stand of his royal dark defenders. Lord Prince Aikumarbe moved quickly. With loyal Aikiki warriors in the skyways and Be warriors on the planets, the takeover of the solar system was quick and decisive. 
Prince Saikumar Bey found little resistance. The inhabitants of the Al Al Kingdom supported his rebellion. They opposed the rule of the ASARRR Empire. Small pockets of Anu loyalists were captured and neutralized. Prince Aikumar Bey had won. And in his victory, he had captured the mighty AR, flagship of the war armada of ASARRR. The cries of celebration were tumultuous. Long live the prince, long live mighty Zhu. The prince was victorious. As king of the rebel kingdom, he would become known as King Zuzu or Zeus, Zeus. The capture of the AR of Anu would earn Zuzu yet another name, Arzu, Supreme Lord of the AR. In honor of his victory, the palace of his grandfather, previously called Al Ambahu, was renamed Al Ambahu Zu or Al Ambazu. Olympus, place of gathering of Al and Zu. The glory of the throne of Aridu was his. This is a footnote. The battle of Anu and Kumarbi, an ancient legend found on Babylonian clay tablets, describes a royal battle in the skies in which Prince Kumarbi fights with and defeats King Anu, who flees into heaven. Before the battle is over, Kumarbi bites Anu in the genitals, hurting him. The story really says Kumarbi used his teeth, Dak, on Anu's ball of power, the AR. End of footnote. King Zuzu, Zeus, knew he would not be able to savor his triumph for long. A new war was about to begin, a war which pitted his young solar system and its inhabitants against an older star system that was the home of their ancestors. Back in ASARRR, King Anu stormed through his palace. The specific event he had planned to avoid, a revolt led by Prince Aikumar Bey, had not only happened, but had forced Anu himself to flee in humiliation. Anu leashed out in an almost uncontrollable rage. He ordered his second AR death ship he made immediately ready be made immediately ready for war. The rebellious Lord Prince Aikumar Bey would pay dearly. Battle forces of elite BH warriors were loaded aboard the AR. The finest Aiku star pilots were summoned, and the AR was armed. Escorted by RRR starfighters and warships, the AR armada passed over the sky above the king's palace. The sight lifted the spirit of the king. Victory was sure to be his. Prince Aikumar Bey would be punished for his blasphemous behavior. But King Zuzu was ready. The captured AR was also made ready. Lord King Arzu Zuzu and his loyal Aiku planned an unexpected welcome for the coming invasion force. Choosing not to await the arrival of the armada, Arzu and his forces planned to ambush the death ship of Anu while it was yet out of the Aridu solar system. As the star fleet from ASARRR approached, Arzu waited. When he felt the moment was right, the Aiku and BAH forces of the rebel empire descended on the armada suddenly and with a fury befitting a galactic lightning storm. The escort ships that were caught by surprise exploded in huge balls of fire. The battle was engaged, flashes of brilliant white and green light crisscrossed through the blackness. Arzu watched the progress of the battle carefully. The moment for unleashing his captured AR had to be precise. As his attack ships struck with deadly accuracy, a sudden break appeared in the formations of Anu's invasion forces. Arzu immediately summoned the captured AR death ship. 
For a brief moment, there was silence as the two large warships faced each other. As two mighty bulls with lowered heads, the paws only preceded the headlong charge. Chaos, thunder and lightning filled the starways. The weapon's fire was overwhelming. Lord King Arzu had to turn away from the blinding light and the deafening noise. When the light flashes stopped, Arzu lifted up his visor and strained to see through the smoke. Fragments flew by his ship. As the haze cleared, Arzu realized what those final explosions had been. They had come from his captured AR death ship. The enormous explosion hurled pieces of metal in every direction. Shards of AR outer skin bounced off Arzu's own ship. The mighty flagship of Anu had defeated Arzu's death ship and continued to move steadily forward. <coughs> Arzu watched in horror as the dying body of the warship hurtled flaming downward into the oncoming path of the world of Kakab Shanama, Uranus. The planet where experiments on the plant and animal life were being conducted by Prince Ea. As the small moon-sized ship of metal entered the atmosphere, a shower of sparks filled the skies. Bolts of blue lightning flashed from the ship to the surface of the planet. The sky over Kakab Shanama was in chaos even before the miles-wide globe of burning metal collided with the world. Striking at an angle, the stricken AR careened off the planet, skidding and bouncing, then catapulting into the black void. Kakab Shanama was tipped over on its axis. Shudders pulsed along the inner caverns of the planet, its quaking core was shaken and toppled. Once an upright world, it now lay on its side. Lord Arzu watched helplessly as his valiant pilots fell into the dark void in the dying AR. They had struck a death blow to a good part of the invasion forces but had given the ultimate sacrifice in doing so. Turning away from sight, Arzu maneuvered his ship in an arc towards the still-moving AR death ship of Anu. Imposing in its size, the AR was truly magnificent in its horror. As Arzu continued to watch, he noticed that the AR moved in an odd fashion. Its path was erratic. The realization suddenly struck Arzu. The destruction beams of his Aikiki pilots had damaged the death ship. The outcome of the battle was still undecided. Arzu could still win a victory. With a renewed sense of hope, he ordered his warships to descend on the AR death ship again with Arzu himself in the lead. Using starfighters to occupy the escort forces, Arzu, in his own starship, went after the crippled AR. Wave after wave of starships attacked the damaged ship again and again as it continued to move into Arzu's solar system. With its own arsenal of powerful death rays, the warship fought its way past distant Iru, Neptune, and the now fallen and tilting world of Kakab Shanama. But the constant fire barrage of Arzu's starships began to take its toll. As the mighty AR moved into the proximity of Targalu, Saturn, the tremendous gravity of the ring planet further pulled the shuddering death ship away from its direct path towards Tiamat. Almost out of control, the ship strained to stay its course. Lord Arzu assembled his forces for one last attack. In one final decisive strike, Lord Arzu and his starships gave their all against the AR. As each starfighter descended and unloaded his arsenal, the AR shook and shuddered. The groan and creaks of the internal explosion sounded like gaulish demonic screams. Suddenly, the AR exploded in flame. 
every part of the death planet shook violently. Smoke and flames erupted from every crevice of the ship. Streaming clouds of blackness trailed behind the staggering ship. The AR of Anu was dying. Arzu sat back in his ship. He had successfully defeated the pride of the ASA RRR fleet. But suddenly he sat forward. The valiant IQ pilots of Anu took aim at the planet of Tiamat with the only weapon they had left, the AR death ship itself. Maneuvering the flaming and disintegrating warship, they hurled themselves directly at Tiamat. The great palace of Al Ambahu Zu was thrown into a panic. The alarm was sent out. Death was about to crash down from the sky. Starships, cargo ships, ships of every sort were commandeered for the purposes of evacuation. But it was too late. Nothing could be done. The inhabitants of Tiamat had no chance. They could not be rescued. It was too late. Lord Arzu could hear the screams of his people over the beams of communication. Turning his head away, Arzu turned off the audio linkage. Arzu's pilots veered his ship away. Lord Arzu had to be saved. The collision was moments away. As the dying AR death ship struck the planet, the ship of Lord Arzu was enveloped in blinding light. In moments, the shock wave struck the ship, bouncing it around as if it were a leaf caught up in a tidal wave. Tumbling and twisting, the ship of Lord Arzu was thrown in the direction of Targalu, narrowly missing the stone rings. When his pilots regained control of the spinning ship, an uneasy Lord Arzu looked back towards his beloved Tiamat. It was no more. The collision had ripped the paradise world apart. Huge chunks of the planet were flying in every direction. Magma, metal, fire and lightning mixed together to create a rain of burning death. Where once the proud planet had stood, only rock debris, smoke and dust remained. Pieces of Tiamat were still flying by him as Arzu moved in to view the destroyed planet. Through a cloud of dust, smoke and gas, Lord Arzu, hoping for the best, maneuvered towards the place Tiamat had once stood. As he pulled out of the dark mists, he saw it. Tiamat or what was left of it. The huge planet, with a gaping hole in its side, a smoke trail behind it, hurtled away from him towards the sun. The prince turned away again. Tiamat was plummeting to its death into the sun below. His people were dead. Arzu was silent. As he looked out, his gaze was met by a solar system that had been ravaged and decimated. The war left its mark on the moons and planets of Aridu. The lives, the cities and the solar system itself was seriously damaged and possibly irreparably so. Lord Arzu looked at the trail of rubble between Dakmo, the red planet and the giant world of Barbaru. Tiamat was no more. Only the grave stones remained. Lord Arzu and the Aikiki, who remained, returned to Dakmu, the central fortress. Dakmu, a wondrous world itself, would become the new royal planet. On Dakmu, Lord and King Arzu would begin again, rebuilding the glory of Tiamat and constructing a new golden era, independent of ASA RRR. As Lord Arzu, now King Zuzu, rested in his palace on a mountain top of Dakmu, an astonishing message was received. The largest fragment of Tiamat had slowed in its fall toward the sun. It would not disappear into the fiery abyss at all. It would come to rest in its own orbit just within the orbit of Dakmu. Lord King Zuzu wasted no time. 
Summoning his own teams of Genesis scientists, he ordered them to rebuild the burned skeletal remains of Tiamat. Somehow, in some way, King Zuzu would bring the glory of the paradise world to life again. The success of the Genesis scientists lifted the king's spirits. He immediately ordered the construction of a large monument, a palace, to commemorate the loyal fallen warriors of Aridu. It would also be a moment to his father and his grandfather. In the hall of Al Al U, Valhalla, on the world reconstructed, they would be honored, never to be forgotten. For a time, the destruction of the AR and its war escort, along with the quick seizure of the Ninth Passageway and its outposts, held the great Anu at bay. The strength of Zuzu and his brilliant war tactics had surprised the ASARRR king and his military forces. It would take time to reevaluate, to plan for another attack. Footnote The Theogony. A Greek tale of old relates the tale of Zeus, Zuzu, and the Olympus gods, al Ambahuzu, who battle against the olden gods of Mount Osiris, Osiris or Sirius. The Theogony reveals that when Zeus went to war with the olden gods, Typhon, a great and hideous monster, was sent by the olden gods to destroy Zeus. When Zeus vanquished, Typhon. Typhon was hurled down a crippled wreck. The huge earth groaned. A great part of huge earth was scorched by the terrible vapor, melting as tin melts. In the glow of a blazing fire did the earth melt down. Typhon was a name of the AR of Anu. End of footnote. But King Zuzu knew this could not last forever. King Anu had suffered much. He would not remain quiet, not for long. Anu had suffered personal attack and injury. He had lost his flagship in a coup takeover and he had lost a second death planet in battle. Zuzu had caused much damage and loss to Anu and he had taken away a key element of the empire's hold on the ninth passageway. Anu would be understandably angry. His empire had been challenged. But Anu had much more at stake. The future of the Ninth Passageway was at risk, as was his hold on the throne. Loss of control of the Ninth Passageway system might give the war queens of Ariane reason to side with the rebel Zuzu. Mining of precious ores and the production of heavy metals was most critical. The queens would not tolerate this vital industry interfered with. Clearly, the king would have to act quickly before the Ariane queens decided to allow Zuzu to remain in power as they had permitted his grandfather Al-Al. And that was not all that concerned Anu. Prince and Lil, also forced to flee the Aridu system, had returned to sit in royal court of ASARRR. The potential threat he posed could not be ignored either. The king faced danger everywhere. But before he could act, the king received word that the SSST queens wanted his presence in the Ariane palace. This worried Anu. He knew they would demand an accounting. His defeat at the hands of the rebel lord Arzu needed to have a resolution and a recourse for alleviation. Anu presented himself before the queens. A plan for the counterattack had been drawn up by his DAC commanders. The argument for immediate action seemed obvious to him. The Ariane queens listened in silence as Anu spoke. In his words were his arguments for the continuance of assaults upon the rebellious star system. On completion of his talk, Anu felt confident he had made his point. As he sat down, he turned to see the chamber doors open. To his dismay, the rebel King Zuzu entered the court. Anu stood to protest, but was commanded to sit quietly. 
As the upstart rebel spoke to the queens, Anu could not remain seated. Leaping to his feet, he was again ordered to sit down. King Zuzu made his position clear. He was the rightful king of Aridu and the people wanted him. The system had not been destroyed, production of metals and the supply of vital mineral minerals could continue. The agreement with his grandfather would be fulfilled, Arzu would honor earlier promises, but without the presence of Anu. As he finished, King Zuzu sat down. The queens did not speak a word, but after a moment an elder queen stood up. Her words were stern. The civil war, regardless of cause, had caused the destruction of Tiamat, a world crucial to the Aridu, ASARRR and Aryan empires. The lives of millions had been threatened. Countless warriors of both systems had died. The SSST queens demanded the cessation of hostilities. There would be no further destruction. The agreements with King Al-Al in the guise of King Zuzu would continue. The war was over. To the horror of King Anu, the rebel would be permitted to live. Once again, a royal member of the house of al al U had thwarted him. King Anu was furious. This he would not permit. There would come a day, he vowed, when the solar system would be a part of the ASARRR empire again. And so, the golden era of Zuzu would flourish, if only for a short time. The tales of the world under the hand of King Zuzu were many. Though a savior to his people, he was still a king and subject to arbitrary whims. Still things were well, but the fates would once again, but the fates would once again interfere with the future of the Aridu solar system. Shortly after the confrontation in the SST palace, the Aryan queens would find themselves facing the looming specter of war with an ages-old enemy. Unfortunately for Zuzu, the threat came from a neighboring star system, not far from his Aridu solar system. Advised of the threatening situation, Anu recognized an opportunity to remove the rebel from power. Approaching the Aryan queens, King Anu made an argument for the removal of the young king Zuzu. The Ninth Passageway was vital to the Aryan Empire. Zuzu, in his ambition to expand his empire, might be swayed to accept support from the very same enemies who threatened to battle against the SSST queens. If Zuzu had rebelled against the ASARRR Empire without it, why would he not rebel against the SSST queen with the support of Aryan enemies? The Aryan queens paused and agreed. They would assist the ASARRR king in his return to the Ninth Passageway solar system to subdue King Zuzu. Lord King Anu was elated. In this venture, he would not fail. This time, the war armadas of both the SST and the ASARRR empires would join forces. By marshalling together his starships and warriors alongside the forces of the SSST queens, Anu had assembled an armada such as had never been seen before. The skies of the Syrian worlds were filled with warships and starships. The ASARRR people, the Asaru, cheered as the king's mighty army made ready its departure. Victory was written in the heavens. Lord King Zuzu was told that a diplomatic entourage was on its way to his solar system kingdom. By the time he was to learn of the trickery, it would be too late. Cloaked and in silence, the armada of warships arrived at the outer edge of the Aridu system before they were detected. This mistake would prove to be fatal to the king and his young empire. The battle was quick and decisive. The invasion forces poured into the solar system. Aikiki and BEH forces of Arzu were overwhelmed by the sheer number of ASARRR and Aryan warships. In short time, the invasion forces surrounded the war planet. But the orders of attack issued by King Anu did not allow for prisoners. 
Dagmo was to suffer total annihilation. The starfighters were furious in their decimation of everything on the surface of Dagmo. The fireballs created by the missile strikes reduced everything, including stone buildings, to cinders and ash. Final strikes with the destructive beams of light and the searing heat beams vaporized everything that remained. What was not blown apart was burnt and melted beyond recognition. King Zuzu was captured and subdued, sentenced to return to the Syrian star system for punishment. All rebel warrior forces of King Zuzu were summarily executed, as were ro loyal, faithful followers. The entirety of the empire's population would be brutally and cruelly punished, guilty or not. The war planet's surface was obliterated. All traces of life under King Zuzu were destroyed. Cities were leveled, for forests destroyed. The beauty of the planet and its civilization was no more. All forms of life were destroyed. With no animals or plants to feed its atmosphere, the once living and thriving planet died. Only its red sands remained. The blood red dust became a fitting memorial to the bloodshed of the solar system war in which billions perished. Great Lord King Anu was relieved. The evil one, rebel King Zuzu was vanquished. The hand of the ASA RRR once was once again restored to the ninth passageway and the realm of the Ariane SSST queens was strengthened once again. And so it was peaceful for a time.